um, and help with the cost of extra cost of development in a more hostile climate. That's what will make it equitable. But within that, uh, Brazil's got an, already got an ambitious climate change action plan. China put one together two years ago. I think it will turn out to be more ambitious than the one they described two years ago. India one year ago, South Africa uh, at the end of last year as well. Mexico, a very promising climate change action plan. You're seeing these action plans developing, but the conditions for taking on targets five or ten years from now uh, will surely be on the rich world and how it performs in developing the technologies, taking on these big targets, sharing the technologies and so on. So that's the rich world, uh, in a, in obviously very, very quickly. That's uh, in developing countries. It, we're going to have to have a, a carbon trading scheme to uh, establish efficiency. The European Union one is going to have to link up with the uh, US one and they're going to have to be other link, link ups elsewhere. We've got to have ways of developing and sharing the technology. Um, we've got to beat deforestation, probably for about $15 billion a year we could cut deforestation in half and we've got to have uh, extra finance for the extra costs of meeting development goals in a more hostile climate. So that's a very thumbnail sketch of a global deal. Those of you who um, would like to buy my book, uh, here's the academic speaking here, uh, which was published in uh, April. It's called A Blueprint for a Safer Planet in, uh, in the UK. It's called um, the Global Deal in the uh, US. This was a big fight between the publishers and the, the US publishers said it's never going to sell unless it's called The Global Deal and the UK publishers said it's never going to sell unless it's called A Blueprint for a Safer Planet. And you could have swapped the emails around. They were exactly the same except for just changing the, uh, the title. Anyway, that's the plug for the book. But if you want to look at it in more detail, these kind of arguments, that, uh, that's where I uh, try to set it out. Now, some of you will have noticed that we have an economic crisis on our hands. What difference does that make to this story? Well, first, one thing we should have learned from the economic crisis is that if you postpone taking on risk, then you uh, face, over time, much bigger consequences. Delay is costly. It's still more true of climate change. You've got this ratchet effect in there that I described. And of course, the kinds of effects we're talking about are far, far bigger than we're seeing right now. They're down the track, that's the, that's, the, uh, that's the difference. We should also learn that if you want to come out of a crisis, you'd better do it in a way that lays the foundation for strong growth in the future. Well, we came out of the crisis which around the burst of the dot-com bubble at the beginning of this century, we sowed the seeds of the next bubble. We don't want to do that this time around. We should be laying the foundation for the strong growth story of the future. What we should not be doing is trying to ratchet back to a form of growth, high carbon growth, which has very little uh, future or no future or a destructive future. So I think the lessons we should learn from this crisis are clear. They strengthen the arguments for acting strongly on this. It's cheaper to invest when more resources are idle. And many of the kinds of resources that are particularly idle are the kind of resources that are relevant here. You know, a lot of weatherproofing uh, is done by construction uh, workers. So, as well as learning the lessons about what we should do next, then um, in terms of risk management and the kind of foundations for growth, there's also a shorter run story in terms of this is actually a sensible way, a sensible way to uh, um, come out of the recession. So that the crisis we're in is deep and of fundamental importance and it's hard. But at the same time, in thinking of how we come out of this crisis, it's not true that any way will do. There's a, a route out of this crisis which is much more constructive for the future than some others. So I see this as a fundamental importance. Now let me um, speak for the last few minutes that are left to me on the relationship between the story I've told and how I understand the EBRD. Please forgive me if my understanding is a bit outdated, but I'm going to stick to principles. Yeah. Um, first, the phenomenon I've talked about, moving to a low carbon economy, moving to more energy efficiency, more efficient economy, the transition to the low carbon economy, is also a problem of transition in the sense of the EBRD's mandate. Why? 
Uh, let's note, by the way, that, uh, well, first, I, I give the quant quantities and I'll give my take on the origins of those quantities. Um, the uh, carbon or emissions to output ratio for the eastern part of the region, what we used to call in our unenlightened days the former Soviet Union, uh, is about three to one. In other words, if you take uh, the European Union, compare it with the eastern part of this region, um, the emissions per unit of output are three times higher in the eastern part of, <coughs> of the region. Two times higher if you just compare Central Europe with the European Union as a whole. So you've got a clear phenomenon where the transition countries are very different in this respect from Europe, their closest uh, uh, neighbours, essentially. Now, how did this come about? Well, it came about in large measure because of the philosophy and practice of the former <coughs> regime. Those of us who studied economics carefully in the 60s read um, both uh, von Hayek and, uh, and Marx. Um, <coughs> I remember, I think when Jacques left, we gave him an original first edition of Adam Smith and the first edition of Capital. Yeah. Um, what is the notion of product in the Marxist concept of product? It's basically stuff you can touch and weigh. The idea of the service sector, for example, as being a part of output, was not there in the Marxist concept of material output, which stood in place of national income. Uh, there was a very particular view of output which was much more focused on energy intensive industries. There was a total disregard for the environment as an input. Yeah. There might have been environmental legislation, we all know that, but actually in the practice there was a total disregard for the environment because, partly because of the very narrow uh, perspective of what meeting plan targets uh, really meant. And there was a gross, a gross wastefulness and mispricing of a key input, which was energy. Energy was spectacularly underpriced under the um, old regime. So this high carbon intensity didn't come out of nowhere. It came out of concept, philosophy, and the practicality of a particular form of planning system and the misguided use of prices. This phenomenon, which is very clear and strong in terms of the emissions per unit of output, came from the old system. Therefore, this, is, this transition to the low carbon economy is very tightly bound up with the transition in the sense to a well-functioning market economy. A market economy which misprices energy and misprices emissions is not a well-functioning market economy. These are very tightly tied up in terms of the uh, transition. Why should the EBRD be involved in this? Well, of course, first and foremost, because it is a transition phenomenon. But the EBRD has developed, from its very early days, um, the uh, tools and sophistication in this area, which it has been um, explaining to many of the other development banks. The core co it's become a core competence in this institution. It's become a comparative advantage in this institution. And not by chance, because in the Articles of Association, which we all used to be able to rehearse, um, we could all chant Article 1, I'm sure you can still do that. Um, the transition to the well-functioning market economy is part of the story, and then I've already articulated well-functioning market in this particular sense, and so too is the environment, and that is why energy efficiency was so strong.